Everyone always says YouTube growth is organic, and I sort of took that literally. Now, anytime someone subs to RuForge, my wall continues to bloom, an entire 3D printed garden of flowers being watered by strangers on the internet. What, you don't believe me? Then why don't you test it out? <laughs> but seriously, one year ago, for some reason, I decided to click publish on the first video I ever made. And although I've yet to make a single dollar from the endeavor, I've learned so much about building and growing on the platform and had loads of fun while doing it alongside you. And to commemorate the channel's birthday, I figured I'd create something a little special. It all started with this, an almost forgotten memory of a plant strung up in my dad's office that ended up being so long he had to zigzag it around his walls. My mind linked the growth of his career with the growth of that plant as they both consistently put in effort each day to keep moving forward. And wanting a similar symbol of growth for this channel, I'm gonna make a kinetic matrix of flowers that bloom when you subscribe. So let's go back in time a bit to when I was trying to figure out how all this would work. I knew that if I designed up some sort of motorized flower mechanism that could open and close, I could command it with a micro controller and connect it to YouTube's data API where we could periodically fetch the channel's current subscribers and tell the flower how much to bloom. And for better or worse, I like overcomplicating things for myself, so I'm going to try and control a whole matrix of these subflowers which I've just now also dubbed as an official term. That means we'll need a servo driver or two acting like intermediaries between the controller and the motorized flowers, allowing them to reliably communicate. In the middle of this mechanical garden, I think it would also be cool to include a display to directly show the sub count since we already have it on hand. I might also toss in some basic RGB LEDs to provide a bit of visual interest feeding into the project's overall ambiance. To power it, I'm gonna use a five volt 40 amp supply that should be able to deliver enough juice for all the electronics with a bit of headroom to spare. And lastly, I'm picking up acrylic paint for the petals and a sheet of moss so that I can bring some real nature into the design and touch grass without having to leave my chair. Now that I've got a plan, it's that time again for me to spend an unholy amount of time in CAD equipped with nothing but my dreams and of course, a can-do attitude. I started by recreating the wall where I wanted to mount the subflowers because without knowing where it's going to go, I won't be able to get a good sense of the design parameters. And given the available space and size of the servos, I decided to make 24 flowers in total, 12 upper and 12 lower, with the subscription counter, controller, and drivers somehow positioned in between. Thinking in modules like this helps me fit everything nicely on my print bed and also be much easier when it comes to assembly and adjustments down the line. For the flower mechanism itself, after trying a bunch of different concepts, I settled on the most simple and reliable method I could think of that also keeps a suitably low profile off the wall. By placing an axle beneath each pedal, I can attach a little press fit hook that makes a stationary hinge. By tossing some teeth on the hook and adding a straight rack gear, I can make the pedal open and close by sliding the rack up and down. Then I revolved the rack to become a circular stem so I could drive multiple pedals at the same time. They were also copied in a circular pattern a few times to form a full, fairly questionable looking flower bud. I put tiny teeth on the bottom of the stem, designed a custom horn for the servo motors, built a base structure with the ability to link up with other subflowers, created a thin cover to hold our moss and secure down adjacent covers, and ended up with this prototype. The press fit clips on the pedals ended up being a bit loose and after tightening them up, they didn't rotate very smoothly. So I made a couple profile adjustments and used adaptive layer heights on the axle portions of the base to make it come out as round as possible, even with the 3D printed layer lines. Also, some of the teeth on the pedals came out a bit weird due to the generated support structure, so I pre-designed in custom supports. Finally, the driver gear was a poor fit and kept slipping. So I rearranged the way it got mounted to keep it properly engaged with the motor. Luckily, I did get one thing right the first time, which was these joinery components that are being used to tile each of the modules together with just a couple M3 screws. I wrote a bit of test code to have the prototype flower repeatedly open and close, and here's how it ended up. All right, buddy, please work. It uh, may look kind of scuffed right now, but with 24 of these, it might just turn out kind of awesome. Unfortunately, I've still got a lot of fun things to work through in order to reach that point, like jumping back into CAD and working out a way for the middle tiles to mount up to the subflowers and secure all the electronics in one compact package. The subscriber display is going to fit right here, and it's made up of eight of these dot matrix modules for a total resolution of 64 by 8, which should be plenty to display a sub count and YouTube logo or something like that. I did find the light coming off of them a bit harsh and hard to make out, even at a low brightness, so I also printed out thin covers to slightly 
defuse them. I designed an enclosure with mounting brackets for the power supply that will end up just below everything else on the wall and put my logo on it because why not. Lastly, I made modular side cover attachments that could utilize the tiling geometry that was already there to hide the exposed outer edges of the subflowers. And now for just a tiny bit of 3D printing. I'm going for a black and dark wood sort of aesthetic since I think it looks super clean while also complementing the moss and primarily white flower petals. So I'm gonna be printing out most of the components in black and some of the joinery and covers in this brown. I was able to print off things like the bases and top covers in sets of four and most of the parts were optimized to not require any generated support structures at all. The petals can be printed off in much larger batches, but several of them failed prior to adding a simple brim layer to keep everything secured to the bed. I did make sure to orient components in a way that would make them print out cleanly, like placing the front facing profiles face down on the heated bed to avoid any visible layer lines on the finished product. I chose this yellowish gold filament for the stems to help them pop out from the rest of the colors and also learned a valuable lesson about heat and overhangs in the process. Here is a poor little stem who's trying to print out at too aggressive of an angle while also having not enough time to cool down. You can see the filament start drooping and kind of building up this blob that makes a really weird tooth structure that will not interface with the flowers too well. But this right here is teeth printed at a less aggressive angle and at slightly slower speeds allowing the structure to properly build on top of itself and hold a clean profile. Exactly what we're looking for. So now that I dialed in all the components, I'm just gonna let the printer serenade me while I try to program everything to actually work. To churn a 1400 line story very short, I programmed this ESP32 with the ability to control all 24 subflowers through I2C communication with those motor drivers we talked about. I did make a quick code change to detach or power down the servos when they're not actively moving, which should make the whole thing super quiet and power efficient. I also wrote some functions to talk directly to YouTube's API and retrieve the current subscriber count so that we can show it on our dot matrix and also move around our subflowers. Getting the dot matrix working wasn't too bad, but all the individual modules thought they were somewhere they weren't, so I had to do a bit of alignment and rotational correction. I also got the LEDs up and running in case I want to include them somewhere else in the project. And the fact that I'm going to have a whole matrix of these individual controlled flowers made me think that we can make some really cool animations. So I built out a ton of functions, which I'll show you very soon. Now to control all those functions and also things like motor speed and RGB, I decided to tie everything together with a local web app. Essentially, I'm creating a basic online remote control that's accessible from any device on the same network that we can use to control the project. With my brain power depleted, it's time to go back to my kindergarten roots and draw outside the lines with some arts and crafts. Is that cool? More like cut along the lines after using this 3D printed reference piece to trace out the moss cutouts. Using a utility knife, I could remove the middle hole and peel away the paper before cutting away any extra moss. And I didn't let that extra go to waste because I wasn't too happy with the density of nature, so I used some hot glue to layer it back on in any thin spots. I used to fear male pattern baldness, but if fixing it's this easy, maybe it won't be that bad. Then I just had to do the same exact thing 23 more times. Hooray! With the moss behind me and a false sense of confidence in my heart, I began the next perilous, punishing, profoundly painful petal painting phase, producing plentiful piles of painted plastic that really challenged my peace of mind. <gasps> I first made sure to strip off any supports or brim structures from each leaf and then cut away any extra materials still attached that may interfere with the gearing. I thought setting aside a solid hour and a half to figure out what would look cool and then just duplicating whatever process I used to get there would be sufficient. However, when your first attempt looks like this, your second like this, and your third like this, there's a long road ahead. After 45 minutes of tinkering, I found a style I liked and just started going for it. First, I would take a slightly wetened, tiny brush and dip it in the red paint before painting feathering strokes on the small portion and then on the larger portion underneath. I then followed it up with the thicker brush that could really fill in the base and also do a bit of fading up the sides. Then I painted the back in white to clean up any bleed over from the red. Although it wasn't necessary on all the petals, I did it on every single one so they would all look similar. And then I decided to put a sort of maroon on the bottom because it makes a really cool gradient effect. As we watch me four and a half hours in, realizing that I'm only just about to reach halfway, let's take a second to put into perspective just the 3D printing alone that went into this one. We're looking at one power supply container, a cable cover and two mounting brackets, two middle tiles, two covers and two diffusers, 24 bases and 80 base joiners, 24 covers and 12 joiners, 18 side covers, 24 stems, 24 driving gears, and 120 individually cleaned and painted pedals. And now that everything's finally together, it's time to get this thing assembled. Putting each flower together honestly wasn't too bad since I included things like reference marks on the gears and slotted guides for the stems. But again, the real challenge here is just repeating whatever steps I had to take 23 more times. 
Due to the location of the motor drivers, I also did need to add custom extension cables for some of the motors because the default length is just too short and buying pre-made extensions seemed like a waste. I just had to measure, cut, strip, solder, and then heat shrink wrap each connection six different times on each of the 12 servos that previously couldn't reach. I also finally pulled the electronics off the temporary breadboard and soldered them to a perf board along with my own janky custom connectors using jumper cables and a bit of tape. Once I finished soldering and putting together the last row, I got super hyped to finally see all them bloom together and hopefully not explode into a bunch of giant plastic shards. I did some temporary cable management and plugged in all the motors, making sure to map them to the correct connectors that I set in the program. And much to my astonishment, it worked pretty freaking well. Three, two, one. Whoa! All right, all going back to blood. <laughs> oh no! Oh, poor guy. Oh, yes! <laughs> so cool. Closing. Then I put in all the joiners, finalized the cable management, put some anchors on the wall, and welcomed the subflower to its new home. I ran power up to the middle control area for the motor drivers, display, controller, and the LEDs that I just now decided to put on top of the entire assembly and shine against the wall. The moss covered covers went on and got secured with more joinery before I closed up the rest of the exposed edges with more of those brown side covers. And after plugging in the display and motor control, I also finalized the middle assembly. I slotted and screwed in the power cable cover and it's finally time to take a step back and call the project complete. The Subflower web app has controls for the servo settings and modes where I can just, you know, select idle bloom and have all of the flowers bloom or go back to a bud. One of my favorite modes is probably the alternating, which is like a checkerboard. But a close second is the cascade. I can make the servos go faster by increasing the step size or decreasing the time between steps. And of course I can do the opposite, increase the time between steps or decrease the step size. The main functionality here though is of course the sub mode, where we'll fetch our current sub count and have the flowers bloom based on how close we are to our goal. The LEDs were really more of an afterthought, but you can still do some pretty fun things with them like turn them all off, turn them all back on to static, increase their brightness, decrease their brightness, change their hue to really whatever you want, or if you're feeling all hues, you can go in a rainbow mode. But I've been enjoying them static and on green which leaves the dot matrix display as the last thing we check out. It's currently on the sub mode, which I'm sure you could tell just displays the current sub count that we have, but it also goes along with the simulate mode when we're trying to find out what it will look like when we do reach our goal. But of course, to have a bit more fun, I set in some other modes as well, like turning all the LEDs on, turning them all off, or even getting them to twinkle. If you enjoyed the video at all and feel so inclined as to help me water my new garden, I would greatly appreciate any support and you making that click for a subscribe. Even though YouTube is more of a late night hobby and excuse for me to engineer random dumb projects, it's still crazy to think that I'm a year deep in the rabbit hole. I set the subflowers to be fully bloomed at 100,000 subscribers, which is bound to take several years, but that's kind of the point of the project to be like that plant in my dad's office and slowly grow as I continually put in effort towards my goals step by step. This is starting to get a little too mushy. I'll uh I'll catch you in the next one. Uh -huh.